Glad to have you all here today. <coughs> Let's take a look at what we have in our bulletin today. First of all, condolences to the family and friends of Phil Hudson. You know, Phil went to be with the Lord this week and uh, so we'll have this uh, funeral Saturday uh, out of Battenberg. And uh, so we certainly extend our condolences to the family and friends. Condolences to the family and friends of Mary Jugan went to be with the Lord last week. That would be uh, Becky Arthur's husband's mother. And uh, so we need to certainly keep that family in prayer. And we also have gifts given to the church by Mr. and Mrs. Kevin Rechak, John and Connie Gabert, and uh, Shirley and Bucky Vale, each in loving memory of Howard Young. So we appreciate all that. Sunday school after morning worship. Ladies meeting this Friday, okay? The Long off in the very far future, July 22nd is here. So ladies meeting Friday, one o'clock here at the church, all ladies welcome. Prayer requested for Chance Lasuski, Debbie Ritter, Helen Mashala, Boyd Vale, Rex Oakley. Rex Oakley had a pretty tough week, folks. They took him to the hospital Sunday. Well, actually, I think it was Saturday. And uh, He's got an ongoing issue with his heart. 15% of his heart is what actually works. And so he was in pretty rough shape Monday, Tuesday. They brought him down to Geisinger. And he has not been considered a candidate for a pacemaker or a heart uh, transplant. Uh, but um, I talked to Sally as late as the day before yesterday, and uh, they really don't know what is going on. If it's, uh, if they're going to try and put a pacemaker in or what. They may just wait for him to calm down. So anyways, that's Rex Oakley. He really needs our prayers. Of course, Tommy Gallagher's back here with us. Chelmsford, Massachusetts Bible Church. That's Brian Reevely. He's their pastor. Wilson Romero, Columbia, Missionary of the Week. And Evelyn Totero is our Senior of the Week. Anybody else ought to be adding to our prayer list here this morning? Helen? Oh, I just want to pray that I'm feeling better. I want to thank everybody for their prayers. Helen is feeling better and grateful. Yes. Good. Anybody else? Anthony? I, I pray for my situation. Uh, my girlfriend is not here right now because she's at work right now. She got a job. I'm very happy for her about that, but on the other side part is that she's been ongoing threatening me with calling the police and putting PFAs on me, so I'm not really happy about that. Mm -hmm. I've been, you know, doing all I can as a man to contribute into the relationship, I've been nothing but good to her, and, you know, I, I try to do all I can, you know, and uh, I just pray that for God to work a miracle with the relationship, if he can, if there's something there. Mm -hmm. If there's something good to fathom and fix in a relationship, let it be. But if there's not, then I'll have to leave away. You know, I'll have to leave away and move a strike and uh, have the Lord look, 
have me bring back, you know, in a path of more people that are Christian people to be there for me in my time right now mm -hmm. with trying to know whatever problem it is. I'm sorry for talking about this, Pastor, but, you know, right. this is a very bad problem here. She's trying to move me away from my Christian faith, and I am not happy about that. That's why I haven't been here for quite a while because of her telling me that um, she doesn't like the people in this church and that... Can't that, blame her. Uh, <laughs> things like that. You know? Yeah, my, we'll certainly keep you in your issues in prayer. And my, and my blood pressure as well, if, if you guys don't mind, I'm sorry, it's been awfully high and um, I've been on medication for it, so I don't know if it's due to what she's putting me through that's making it really high or the foods that she's having us eat. I don't know what it is, but you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> it is what it is. You know, I hope it, I hope it just uh, drops really, you know, down. Okay. You know? I'm sorry. Okay. Thank this you. is our friend Anthony, by the way, in case you know anybody. Anybody else? All right, glad to have you all here today. Let us see what we have here. Why don't we turn to 407 and actually sing that here. 407 praise So I'll stand as we sing. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. 
for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. God will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteousness will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Your head will not forbear the pastors. Their hearts are set as trust in the Lord. Thank you. May be seated. Let's follow our heads whatever we're prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. Thank you again for this special day out of the week. All over the world, Sunday is set aside as a special day of the Lord. Remember the resurrection of Christ, the times you come together, worship you, and honor you, get away from the things of the world, get away from our daily routine, our ordinary cares, all of which have validity. But there's nothing in the world like getting together in your house with your people. And our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon us in a very special and unique way. That we might sense your closeness. That deep in our hearts we might hear your voice with the wisdom and counsel that no man, woman, or child can give anywhere in this universe but from the very heart of God himself. So our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have choose, chosen to reveal yourself to us in just such a way. You speak to us through scripture. You speak to us through the words of other people. And uh, likewise, Father, again, as we said, we hear your voice in our heart. Father, we got friends and family in the prayer list here today who really need your help. We got a list of names of people that have physical illnesses and disabilities that are going to require very intense therapy, very intense medication, surgery, and people recovering from surgery. We pray for all of them, Lord. We ask you for healing for the very best outcome possible. But I also think today, Lord, of the folks who every single day have a burden that is beyond ordinary. They have a husband, they have a wife, they have children, they have parents, grandparents, some special need individual who really can't function in society and needs tremendous attention and are really in a, a life-altering thing. And yet there are people who every single day show up at that rock pile and deliver. We ask you, our Heavenly Father, your deepest and richest blessing upon each and every one, and that you fill their hearts with a sense of peace, a sense of your presence, a sense of purpose. Again, our Heavenly Father, we all have purposes here in this world. Uh, often we think that, uh, you know, it should be some celebrated thing, it should be some highly illuminated, illustrious maneuver that would visibly change the world. But more often than not, our purpose here in this world is sitting right across the kitchen table from us, or right across the living room, or the people we see and pass by every day. And our Heavenly Father, we ask you to speak to our hearts about these things, and we might take up whatever cross it is that we're able to bear, not only on our own behalf, but on behalf of those around us, and we'll be so grateful because we will sense your presence and power, and we will sense a real degree of purpose. It's when we get so introverted <coughs> and so self-centered that all we think about is our own issues and our own problems that very often we run aground and find ourselves in a uh, deep state of disappointment. But our Heavenly Father, if we're capable, to call us, call our attention higher and to greater <coughs> things. We pray today also for our friends out in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, Ryan Reevely. And we just ask you deepest and richest blessing on this. Uh, he's not really a young man anymore, but uh, a friend of ours from Arkansas. And his wife's from Wisconsin. And uh, we just thank you for bringing him to us here in the Primitive Methodist Conference. We thank you for the church and all they do and all that they experience up there together. We pray for the Romeros, Wilson and Idris down there in Columbia. We ask your blessing on them every single day they might continue to bring good news to men, women, and children, and 
bring the joy of salvation to bear on hearts and souls. We pray for our friend Evelyn Tatero over in Carbondale. We ask you to be with all our seniors who are unable to be home and unable to be living the lives that uh, we're so familiar, but uh, just age has taken that away in so many cases. And so our Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon Evelyn and all those in similar situations. We also pray for those who have lost loved ones in recent days. Specifically, we think of the Hudson's and we think of Mary Juven's family. And once again, Lord, uh, we're grateful for the lives of these people. We're grateful that we send them on to you with hope. We're not sending them off into some, gee, I wonder, uh, it's awful dim and dusky and uh, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, you have made it really plain to us that you are merciful and gracious. And you have made it really plain to us in Christ Jesus that it is your intention to save souls. So our Heavenly Father, we turn these ones over to you with confidence and hope. We're trusting in you. We're trusting in your grace and the power of Jesus Christ and his cross. Our Heavenly Father, we pray all day to be aware of the enterprise, the United States Armed Forces, uh, the first team, uh, law enforcement agents up and down the line, border patrol folk, first responders, everybody who represents us down in Washington, Lord, we, we just bring them before you and ask you to help each and every one. Lord, for all the things we're not gonna voice this morning, but all the things that are very needed, we ask you to hear and answer all our prayers. We gather our voices together and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom. Hey, Debbie, why don't you pick a
the bird's eyes you have to pay attention to. Follow <laughs> <laughs> on. Allow me to finish my anti yawn capsule. <laughs> Isaiah 49, it's on the back of your bulletin, the lion's share of what we'll look at. I'm going to read the second and third paragraph there, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into this. See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west, some from the region of Aswan, in other words, the south. Shout for joy, you heavens, and rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people, and he will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Hey, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion in the child she has born? Though she may forget, I'm not going to forget you. I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your holy word. Because again, Lord, we're ordinary people down here in this world. We have the sight of sense, sound, taste, touch, and smell. And we got intelligence and intuition and reason and logic, but that's all limited to what we experience and what we've seen and what we understand and what we, where we are. We need to hear from on high. We need a better perspective. And the people on TV and the people on the internet and the so-called journalists and all the rest of that noisy crowd, uh, they're all just like us. They have opinions, they have thoughts. Um, Lord, we need to hear from on high. We need to hear a word from heaven. We need to hear your voice. We need instruction that is eternal and that is true and that will never ever fail. And the good news is you have given us all those things through the Holy Scriptures, through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The life of Jesus Christ allows us the greatest revelation of God that is possible. So please speak to us through these days. And we'll be so grateful that you are so good to us. Because it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Nothing ever changes, does it? Things are never different. Never any relief, never any help, never any hope. It seems to just get a little bit more dimmer with the years, a little bit darker. And uh, we're stuck in a rut. We're stuck in a pickle. No news is good news. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> we say those things all the time. Yeah. And, you know, the problem is that we don't have a really great perspective. Uh, you plant a tree. Most, uh, when I was a kid, we had cherry trees out in front of our house. And, uh, Gosh, you could go there in the middle of this, I don't know, I guess it would be in the summer, and pick cherries right off that tree, and they were great. We were surrounded by raspberry bushes, and wild raspberries, and, uh, and you could pick them by the handful, and they were just there. We didn't do anything about them. They just were there, 
and they were so good. We had crab apple trees in front of our house. And uh, you could go through those crab apples, and if there was a worm in it, you ate around the worm. And you found some without a worm in it, and it was so good. They were always there. You know when you plant a tree, put a seed in the ground, it doesn't make any noise at all, right? It just quietly, silently, little by little, the, that seed that you don't even see sprouts. And then one day it materializes, uh, the first parts of it stick up out of the ground and it just looks like a piece of grass, I guess, a weed maybe. And then one day it's uh, a little piece of shrubbery and uh, but the day comes when it's without a single sound, without you hearing or seeing anything. There's cherries or apples or beautiful blossoms materialize. But you know when you chop that tree down or when you get one of these big, I remember watching these big stump grinders on YouTube that are mounted on the front of a tractor and they go, they go plowing through a forest almost and make it look like they're just going through a bush hog in a field. That's the noisy process when you knock the tree down, when you destroy it, when you chop it down, even if you burn it. There's snap, crackle, and pop, and a lot of heat going on, and a lot of visibility. And that's the situation. Destruction's really loud. Destruction's really visible. Destruction gets our attention. But growth is so incremental. It's so, shall we say, I don't know, ingrained that you don't even notice it happening. And the situation that we live in in this world is we're always in a, situa in a uh, stage of flux. Things are always changing, whether you realize it or not. Things are always growing different. We're changing, and again, it's so gradual, you don't notice it from day to day, but if you remember back when you were uh, 18 years old. Now, about two years ago, we had a situation in the study where the floor kept sagging. And uh, I went down in the basement to look around and it turns out there's a big, big timber sticking out here and on which the floor rests. But the problem is, the timber was born up here, but it was just sticking out into nowhere here. And they nailed it with these great big nails into the timber that was here. But those nails, over the period of time, and I mean, they're, I don't know how many pennies you'd call them, but they were, they were spikes. Gradually worked their way out, and gradually that floor sank. And so I put to shoring it up, and then I get on the floor and start leveling the floor in there. And I got down on the floor, and I got up, and I got back down on the floor, and I got up. And I did that about 35 times in the first hour. And it was exhausting. I mean, just getting up and down off the floor. Some people say, if you know, you've got to get down on the floor, you better have a plan to get back up. <laughs> Jeez, when we were kids, we were running around on the ground. We used to do what they call grass drills, right, in football. You run in place, throw yourself in the ground, and bounce back up as fast as you can, just like that, over and over and over again. But now, somehow, over 40-some years, little by little, it's more and more difficult to get up off the ground. You want to work out? You don't need to go to the gym. Just lay down on the floor and get up. And do that again 20 times. Tell me how you feel. Well, that's the way it all works. The nation of Israel, they're in a pickle here in this book of Isaiah. They're on the verge of losing their country. The, the, the cast has been set. Israel, Israel, and God deals with Israel. Think about this now. When we talk about Israel, we're not talking about an individual. We here in America and in evangelical churches, we think of ourselves more as an individual than as a group. We believe we're saved individually and therefore become a part of the church. 
Some people emphasize or think that you're saved by virtue of being coming, joining the church. The church is what's saved, not the individual. Right? Well, we believe that we're all responsible for our own individual salvation. We're responsible for our own individual souls. We make the decision to walk with the Lord or not. And that's legit. That's true. That's as biblical as you can get. But the old covenant, God dealt with Israel as a nation. He dealt with them not just as individuals, but as a group. And that group transcended generations. So when God was talking to Israel today and telling them of great things that are going to happen to them, they're not even going to be here for that. It's their ancestors. Their children's 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 children who are going to experience that grace and that blessing. Well, that's really interesting. I think God has looked at every single possibility that there is in ex existence and made a demonstration through all of history. No matter what the situation is, no matter where in the timeline you are, no matter what evil comes, no matter what good comes, I will overcome it all. I will demonstrate to all eternity, to every angel, to every devil, to every demon, to every human being, whoever experiences anything, that I am King of Kings and Lord of Lords of everything. Nation of Israel, you cast your lot. <clears throat> we read last week the unbelievable downfall of the nation of Israel. I mean sacrificing their own children to foreign gods. God came to Israel and he saved them and he said, look, you're the apple of my eye. I'm delivering you from slavery. I want you to be with me. You're my chosen people. And little by little, Israel drifted away until finally they're sacrificing their kids to the gods of the storm, the gods of other nations. Right in the temple of the Lord, they've got statues of other gods that they worship and honor because we don't want to leave any of the gods out. And they've, they can't work. You can't worship something short of God. When you worship anything, okay, that's why you got that's why repentance is not as easy as it seems. You gotta get honest with yourself. You gotta get straight. You worship something, you're revealing two things. A, you're revealing that this is my ideal. This is what I think is the best. This is the ultimate. This is what I'm willing to commit myself to because I see this as God. And so it reveals your thoughts of your heart, the thoughts of your mind, the kind of condition of your soul. It's all revealed by what you really worship. And boy, I'll tell you, anything short of God, it can't save. That's why we read passage after passage in the Bible. Oh, in the day of calling upon your gods, they're going to abandon you. They're going to fail you because they are no gods. They can't save. There's only one name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. There's only one that died as a sacrifice for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Not a variety. Not a selection. Not a go through the you know uh, lunch line and take some of this and some of that and maybe some over here. There's only one. And that is the God who has revealed himself in Scripture through the nation of Israel and primarily through Jesus Christ. In Israel, you've chosen the whirlwind and now you're reaping the whirlwind. You're losing your country. Babylon is going to come from the north and they're going to wipe out Jerusalem. They're going to take everything you have. They're going to take your children away from you. They're going to take your children out of your house. And they're going to bring them wherever they please. And if you've got daughters, they're going to be pleasing some man somewhere. And you're not even going to be there. You have nothing to do with it. And she's got no choice in the matter either. They're going to take your boys, and they're going to make your boys, they're going to enslave them. They're going to send them down in the silver mine. So when that thing caves, they, they bring out the silver, but then the mine caves in. Well, you know... <laughs> We didn't lose much, did we? It's not my kids down there. 
Israel, that's what's on the horizon. Your sins are going to be visited on your children, your children's children, your children's children. When I first read that in the Bible, I thought, that doesn't really sound fair, does it? The children should suffer for the behavior of their parents? Well, forget about whether it's fair or not. It's a fact. It's a reality. Okay, the life we live has consequences. This is real time. I read about, jeez, these wars and... Well, actually, I'm reading about Dodge City and life of the American West. And you got killed, you got killed. What if you're only 18 years old? That just didn't. What if you're fully healthy, 18 years old, you're about to get married, you've got a beautiful girl you're going to take to be your bride, and you're planning your farm, and you're planning your children, and everything else, and then you get cholera. And Doc Adams, the best he can do is keep you away from everybody else so they don't get it. And if you die, you just die. That's the way it goes. That's life. Right? That's reality. Israel, you and me, playing a, life is a loaded gun. And you use it wisely and use it rightly. And it's the greatest thing in the world. And you get your perspective right so you know that this isn't the ultimate. We're in, a, we're, we're, we're in the process of changing. We're on a journey that's headed somewhere. We're not going to end up where we are now. Israel, dark days lay ahead. But this is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I'll answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. Now, Israel, you need to learn some lessons. Israel, you need to learn about the consequence of your behavior. People, you need to learn that when you disobey God, it hurts you. It hurts other people. It hurts the ones around you. So that you don't behave that way anymore so that you don't do the things that you used to do. Salvation is designed to deliver us from bad behavior. It's not a band-aid to cover up the bad behavior so that we don't see it, we recategorize it, we change the names, we change the words, we scrub away that idea of sin because we don't want to have that. That's ugly and that's really a judgmental thing. Who in the world, who in the world are you or I to decide what's sin and what isn't? The answer? We're not. But there is one who is. And he has created the heavens and the earth and made it in a way that there is chaos and there is peace and there is joy and there's sorrow. It's real life. It's alive. Okay? This isn't some game that we're in the midst of. Israel, you behave really badly. And you're seeing the consequences of your behavior right now, but don't give up. In the time of my favor, I'm going to come and answer you. I will keep you, when you realize that your gods are not gods at all, they're not helping you at all. They're dragging you away from the one who loves you. They're dragging you away from the good life that you can have. All our bad habits. <laughs> We've got bad habits. And we know they're bad. And we know they're counterproductive. And then we know they make our lives not what we wish they were. But they seem to be so ingrained that we overcome a bad habit for a day and then we can take a day off and go right back to where we were when we started and now we've lost two days the day we made progress and now the day we fell back and two days have gone off the calendar or right before we started why do we do that we weren't created that way. 
That's the power of sin. It's infected every last one of us in one way or another. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be saved by the grace of God. We will be saved by the mercy of God. We will be saved because our loving Father Lord says, look, I understand you're infected. And I know you infected yourself. You brought this on yourself. But I'm going to keep you. And I'm going to make you as a covenant for the people. They're going to look at the way I am with you. And they're going to want in. Israel, they're going to see that I chasten you. That I discipline you. But I don't leave you. Listen to what's going to happen. I will keep you and I'll make you a covenant for the people. I'm going to restore the land and I'm going to reassign its desolate inheritances. To say to the captives, you know, those who have been taken away, your daughters who have been taken away to a faraway land, your sons have been taken away from you to a faraway land, your parents who were just killed before your eyes because they were in the way. Well, I'm going to say to the captives, one of these days, you come out. And to those in darkness, be free. They'll feed beside the roads and they'll find pasture on every barren hill. What used to be barren is going to be lush and green. Because it's the cycle that I built into the universe. That things don't stay the same. And you cycle through a process of growth where you find out your weaknesses. You find out what's wrong. And through my grace, like the growing of that tree, gradually building you back into what you could be and what you need to be, and you're going to find that one day the things that you, when you realize how desolate they are, I'll change that. And it'll be lush and wonderful. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They'll neither hunger nor thirst. Nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them. And it will lead them beside springs of water. That magnificent thing. You know what it's like to be in a hot desert land? We're talking about that this morning. We haven't ran, had rain in a little bit, right? A week or two. What if you didn't have rain for three years? And that's not uncommon. That happens in places of the world. They can go for three years without rain. Our grass is now turning red, right? It's starting to turn red. It's not even brown, it's red. Well, then, when you don't get rain for three years, that red, that just disappears in chafe. And everything's brown, dry, cracked. It's called a desert. You can't live there. You have to pass through and pass through quickly, or you're going to die in that desert. There's no life in it. Okay? But when I was a kid in upstate New York, we lived out in the country, and every time, you know, Syracuse always get 100, 150 inches of snow. But that snow would melt. And in our backyard, springs would come up, springs of water. And the grass would be beautiful and green from this fresh water. And the water was so clear and so sweet and so beautiful. And we had this, there was a fence post out in the, between the, the end of our yard, and then there was fields out there where they would hay. And every, I don't know if it's the same one or not, but every spring there'd be a robin. That's how we learned about robins. Mom says, that's a robin redbreast. And that robin would be out there in that fence post, and this fresh, clear water was coming up, well, that's what God says he's going to do with the deserts that are in our lives. With the barrenness and the disastrous results of sin and its ugliness here in this world. The desert heat of the sun won't beat down anymore. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I'll turn my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. They'll come from afar, from the north, the south, from the west. Shout for joy. You're in hot water now. You're in a terrible situation. 
But I'm telling you the days will come where you'll shout for joy. Your heavens, rejoice. You earth, burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people. And he will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. That's what we feel like. The Lord's forsaken me. The Lord's forgotten me. Is that what the Lord does? How about our friend Joseph back in the Old Testament? What do you think he felt like when his brothers said, finally, just out uh, now, you know, we, we hate this guy and we want to kill him. And they threw him in that pit. What do you suppose his first night was like in that pit? Down in the bottom of that hole wondering, gee, I wonder if they'll ever have mercy on me. I wonder if when the morning comes, they'll say, Gee, Joseph, you are our brother. We can't really do this to you. And when morning comes, they say, you know, how are we going to kill this kid? And then somebody says, well, let's sell him into slavery. Why, why waste, you know, this life? We can sell him to those Midianite caravan over there. And that little boy, put yourself in his place. You be Joseph. They drag you up out of the pit, and you think, oh, good, they're going to have mercy on me. And the next thing you know, you're over in the caravan and they're on their way down to Egypt. And they go back home and they tell dad, oh, he's dead. Look at this, the coat of many colors, you know, that fancy coat you got your special son. Oh, it's a shame, but evidently some wild animal got him. Because the thing's covered with blood. And they covered it with goat's blood, didn't they? And Joseph goes down into slavery in Egypt. You know how many times, you know how many prayers are recorded in the Bible that Joseph prayed? Let's see. I think there's one, two. No, there's none. There's no place in the story of Joseph where he prays. I wonder what that means. I wonder if it means he just thought, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord's forgotten me. Because now I'm down here in slavery. And he gets into Pharaoh's house and he's doing a good job. And it looks like his new life down in Egypt is going to turn out okay until Pharaoh's wife sees him and thinks, God, he's handsome, you know? And she wants to have fun with him. And he, I couldn't do that. I can't be betray my master, the guy I'm working for. He's been good to me. And she says, oh, really? And she cries rape. Made it up. Complete lie. And now Joseph's in prison down in Egypt. You think he felt like the hand of God was upon him, leading him and guiding him into all truth? You think the hand of God, you think he laid down on his floor of his prison cell and says, oh God of heaven and earth, I've never felt closer to you. No, I think he felt like Israel here when he said, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. And then finally one day he interprets a dream and he gets out of jail and he's thinking, oh, he's back in jail. The, kid, the, or the, the guy he interpreted the dream for forgot him. He got out of jail and he said, Hi, Mom, I ain't wasting my time on any Joseph. And Joseph's left behind once again. But years and years and years down the road, there's a famine in the land. Something Joseph had nothing to do with. And all of a sudden, Joseph's father says, if we don't get down to Egypt where they got some grain, we're all going to die. Tells the boys, go down to Egypt. And lo and behold, they run into their brother Joseph. Joseph recognizes him, but they don't recognize him at all. When Joseph was down in the bottom of that pit and hoping for mercy, it was hopeless. And his hopelessness was reinforced when they drug him out of the pit and sold him into slavery. I know my brother Raymond and David, my sister. I think of your brothers and sisters. Would you sell them into slavery? Would you throw them in a pit and abandon them? Would you go and tell dad, geez, I, I guess he's dead. Well, what are we going to do? And that's Joseph. And then one day, the brothers come back after a couple of visits. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. I'm Joseph. And they're floored. They're scared to death. Because now they're talking to the chief executive officer of all of Egypt. 
and it's the guy that they left for dead, that they sold into slavery. He's not laying in the bottom of a pit anymore, is he? He's not being sold into slavery anymore. He's a full grown man. He's the CEO of Egypt. And the brothers are scared to death that there's going to retribution. And then their father dies and they say, now there's nothing between us and Joseph. We can't hide behind the old man anymore. And they beg for mercy, Joseph, to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, you guys. You, you meant it for evil. But see, God meant it for good. You know that recurs every page of the Bible. You meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. You took up a hammer and nailed my son to a cross, trying to get rid of him. You weren't presenting me with a sacrifice. You were torturing somebody, humiliating him, and destroying him to get him out of your way. But that very act turned out to be the salvation of whosoever will. Every man, woman, and child who ever come to the Lord will come through Jesus Christ. Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me. When, jo when King David, anointed to be king of Israel, is hiding in caves, hiding in deserts, hiding in forests. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Job said it. Every page of the Bible, someone's saying it. Paul's in jail. The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And God answers, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Could a mother forget the baby at her breast? Can a mother have no compassion on the child that she has labored to bring forth? Birth pangs is what the words are in the original. She went through birth pangs to bring that child forth. The pain of childbirth. And you think she's going to forget that and have compassion? And then God says, hey, she might forget, but I'll never forget you. I engraved you in the palm of my hands. Your walls, that which protects you, that's what a wall means in ancient parlance, the walls, they're ever before me. My number one concern when I get up in the morning and I go to scratch my head, I see your name written on my hand. And your walls, your protection, your issues, your interests are always before me. Your children are going to hasten back. And those who laid waste to you, they're going to depart. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and they're going to come to you. You know the daughter they took away that you thought you'd never ever see again. Don't quit. Don't quit. Hang in there. Because God does unbelievable things. It's on every page of the Bible. And it's standing before you. What do I tell them? This is our 29th year here in Germany. My, uh, to say 40 years <clears throat> been in the ministry 36 I guess and the people in Owego said that's one guy who will never get saved and teachers hit me in the head with rolled up papers <laughs> and said you are a dummy and you're going nowhere and some of those friends of mine wrote things in my yearbook they weren't really my friends. They were good kids. And they wrote, I hope you wake up or you're gonna spend your whole life operating a jackhammer. And I remember reading that thinking, is that a blessing or a curse? I kinda like the idea of operating a jackhammer, but it sounds like fun. My mother used to say, Alan, if you don't grow up, wake up, you're gonna end up digging ditches all your life. Right? What's so bad about that? I mean, you're a heavy equipment operator, man. They play with toys all day. <laughs> My mom used to say, Alan, if dad would be disgusted with a report card, his mom would say, you're going to come home from work and you're going to have to go out on the back porch and your wife's going to tell you, shake the worms out of your pants before you come in here. And I remember standing on, in my mind's eye, standing on our back porch in Manlius, dressed but without my pants on, I guess they had underpants on, shaking worms out of my pants so I could come in the house. 
And God got into my life and changed everything. Literally changed everything. And what did I do? I took a job at the Johnson City Primitive Methodist Church because I was on unemployment and that would make more money sweeping their floors than I could on unemployment for the foundry. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't looking to be saved. I didn't even know what salvation meant when I entered into that church. Those ladies, they come out and they look in the back of my car and see a pile of whiskey and wine bottles and beer cans and Betty Deck would shake her head. And then when I got saved, she says, I've been praying for you every day. Things change. God changes, but they are changing. They are changing. Don't doubt it. Destruction happens loud and obviously. A change in growth is so incremental that it's invisible. But to those mile markers and to those periods of time when you look back and say, God, I thought this would never, ever happen. And here I am. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. You have not left us as orphans down here in this world. Now your people all through the Bible have said, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. My God, my God, Jesus Christ hung from a cross and quoted David in the Psalms. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? People down here on this planet have been crying that cry ever since we've been here. And we've looked into hopelessness and disappointment and dishonesty and deceit and wicked prosper and the lies are celebrated and the truth is condemned to a lie. Right down to Jesus Christ being crucified because we don't want him down here. <coughs> and yet, you and your transforming power never leave us or abandon us. Would you please buoy our faith? Would you please open our eyes to see what you're capable of and help us to take nourishment and strength and hope for the soul from what you're capable of, not what we see now. Because what we see now, in many cases, is disastrous. <clears throat> what you have on the horizon is like a spring coming up in the desert. Father, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn on our hymnals to 422. Four twenty two, let's all stand.
So our Father, speak to us. The God who changes things. You're the one we worship because you're good. You're just right. You're the only God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.